Generation Church, someone say, remain calm. Remain calm. Excited you're here today. We have a uh, message for you that really fits with our last week here in Florida, doesn't it? Remaining calm. We've had quite a bit go on, and um, before we get into the word today, um, I just want to talk about that. This last week was a, a pretty chaotic week here in Florida. Um, but as a church, I want you to know some of the things that we are doing here to help those that were impacted by the hurricanes and the tornadoes. And so first and foremost, I wanna thank you for each and every one of you that faithfully tithe, that returned the tithe back to God, that you have been partner here at Generation Church. Because of you, um, in the middle of the storms, we were able to, um, we were in a position to give thousands upon thousands to Convoy of Hope, so they could be boots on the ground immediately, right in the middle of it. So thank you, give yourself a hand. When you partner here at GC, it goes towards a lot of things. That's one of them. Convoy of Hope is a partner of ours. And um, then I want to tell you about something else going on, and this is extremely important as well. This is the, by far the largest outreach that we're about to um, do right here. And we had a Thanksgiving outreach planned for November the 9th, and we are going to postpone that and do that at a different time. What we are doing instead is we're partnering with an organization called Kids around the world. It's an organization you'll hear about a lot more as this year goes on. It's a new partner of ours um, that we'll be doing a lot of amazing uh, work with. But we are coming together with kids around the world on November the 9th. We're going to meet at the JCS, the Jupiter Christian School Gymnasium. And we are going to pack from 9 o'clock until 2 o'clock that day. There's two shifts, 9 to 11 and 12 to 2, with a one-hour break in the middle to kind of reset and all the logistical things. But we are going to pack. Are you ready? 500,000 meals in one day. I hear you clapping, but that means you need to sign up, right? So what this takes is this. It takes about 650 people per shift to even pull this off. So this goes beyond Generation Church. What we need is for you and your families. This is all ages can be a part of this. We need everyone to be signing up. All you gotta do is tap your phone on that tap tag in front of you. You'll see it, it's in a red right there. Sign up for that or go to generationchurch.com slash events. Be a part of it, invite your neighbors to be a part of it, the people you work with. Get everyone here in Jupiter and the surrounding areas involved because 500,000 meals will be distributed from Convoy of Hope once we complete this task that day. You are making a difference, amen? amen? So sign up, I wanna see you there. It's gonna be a, an amazing time of us being able to share the love of God, be the hands and feet, truly the hands and feet of Jesus. I, I believe here at GC, like we are a church that whenever the storms hit, we're gonna go get our hands dirty and love on some people out there in our community, amen? So let's go ahead and get into the word today. Someone say, remain calm. Remain calm. Man, I got lots of content this week. The world helped me have some content, but have you ever just had a bad day? Like that you wake up and the theme song of your day is, I had a bad day, the cameras won't lie, right? One of those days where you just had a bad, where it feels like the world is just against you. I had one of those days about a month and a half ago. We went to Universal Studios as a family, and there's five of us in our family, and there was this one moment where a whole bunch of our family could come together for one day at Universal and have a family day. And our family has the annual passes. So we split everyone up into two vehicles. We had my parents were there and a couple friends of ours. And then we also had Kristen's brother and his family. And so we are all there, a party of 12. How many people know it can have some chaos when you show up at a theme park with a party of 12? So we show up and Kristen's group gets there first. And they go into the park. They're there about 10 minutes before us. My car needed Starbucks, you know. So she goes in. And they're having a good time. And we show up and everyone's in the line scanning in. And since we have the annual passes, I don't carry the physical card on me. I just have the app and I just scan my app when we go in there. So we're in line. And as we're in line getting closer and closer, something glitches on the app. 
Now I get on the universal Wi-Fi, I get off the universal Wi-Fi, I'm trying everything, right? right? You're seeing this line, you're like, oh, oh my goodness, you're like, you're getting stressed. I get up to the person and they're like, we can't let you in. I'm like, I got annual passes. I need a scan, I don't know what to do, it's the app. They're like, I'm sorry, you have to go back to Will Call and, and get your new tickets printed. I'm like, I don't wanna go to Will Call. <laughs> Will Call is full of people that think that they're at a water park and they haven't even figured it out yet. You know what I mean? Like, I don't wanna go there. So I talked to multiple employees on my way to Will Call and they're like, all they're going, no, you have to go to Will Call. Go, have to go. So me and my youngest son, Maverick, he's five, we show up at the Will Call line. We're the only ones that can't get into this park. And we're standing in line, and I'm calling guest services. Like, you have to stand in line. I'm trying to find some way around, but I can't get my tickets. And so we wait in this line for an hour. My family's all inside having a good time. I'm in the longest line of the day. We get up there after an hour, and this teenage kid takes about 30 seconds for him to reprint my tickets. I said, man, thank you so much, but what are you going to do to make this right? He's like, I can't do anything. I was like, ah, you're gonna have to do something. <laughs> so he calls his manager. Manager comes over, he's really wonderful. He's like, well, the only thing I can do is give your entire party, the 12 people, one fast pass to a ride. I'm like, that's great, that's fine. We can use it however we want throughout that day. That's great. So I go and we meet up with everybody again and we're having a great day. We're using some of the passes, not all the passes, just some of them and we're going through the day and we get midway through and we decide we wanna hop to the other park. But my niece, she loves Harry Potter and has never been to Universal and she wants to ride the train. So we want her to have this experience. And so the line is really long. So we have the idea, let's use some of these passes so some of them can go on the train across. But for us that have done this a million times, like our two friends and two of my boys and myself, we'll do the walk around to the other park. No big deal. We've done it before. So we do the walk and they do the train. My friends, they go through the park. My first son goes to the park. My second son goes to the park, and I scan, they're like, it's not working. <laughs> of course it's not. That makes sense. So when something's not working, they raise their hand like this, right? So this manager walks up, and this is how he begins our conversation. He goes, I can see why it's not working. It's not his ticket. I'm like, oh, hey, excuse me. Um, it is my ticket. This is what happened. I explained the entire day to him. I got proof, I got, I got guest service that is on my phone record, I, I got proof. Like things have happened and to get us to this place, you're like, nope, it's not your ticket. I'm like, it is my ticket. He's like, it's not you, I know it's not you because it can't be you if it was scanned this way. I was like, it is me, I am me, I promise that. And I told him, I was like, I don't know how to have this conversation with you because there's nothing you're going to say to me that makes me go, oh, I'll tell you the truth now, because I am. He's like, it's not your ticket. Well, I'll go see what the other managers wanna do. I'm like, okay, so now I'm in this weird position where I'm over here, my two kids are sitting on the floor on the other side inside the park now, right? And I'm like, I promise I belong to them. <laughs> like, no, I'll go see what the managers wanna do. I'm like, okay, whatever. 10 minutes goes by, still standing there. My kids are still sitting across. And I tell this girl, I'm like, you know, he hasn't come back yet, so I walk up to the girl. 14 age girl that's running the ticket line. I said, hey, listen, I'm not trying to be rude, but if he's not back in two minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and walk past you and into the park and have a good time with my family. And I don't know what protocol is, but if you guys have to arrest me or something, go ahead, but it's gonna get really awkward whenever you all find out that I'm the one telling the truth. She goes like this. <laughs> Manager two shows up. What's going on? Now I go explain the entire thing all over again. I'm getting good at my story. Tell him the whole thing. And also tell him that this other manager was really rude to me, calling me a liar, that it wasn't my ticket. And I don't know what's going on, but I'm supposed to be in there with all the other 11 people. So he's going through, he's like, yeah, that is weird. And he's being really great about it. He's trying to figure it out for me and we're working through this thing. I can see like what he's saying. I understand the confusion, but I don't know why it's happening because I really am me. And so we're looking through this thing and all of a sudden, manager one shows back up. He goes, okay, this one time we'll let you in. <laughs> I'm like, bro, look, I'm not looking for a favor. I paid to be in this park. You know what I'm saying? Like, thank you, I'm not, I'm not asking for a handout. My money paid to be in there. 
And so the other guy's like, okay, listen, scan it. I'll override it. We're all good. So I scan and he's going through and he's trying to figure it out. The entire time he's doing this for me, the other man is going, I know it's not your ticket though. You're just trying to work the system. You're just trying to get, and I'm going like, what is going on? This dude doesn't know that I'm a pastor. Can I keep it that way? You know, like you're running through all of it in your mind. Like, I don't want to end up on YouTube. Would that go viral? Like, <sighs> so as this is happening and he's talking at me, the other manager's now seeing what I was talking about. He goes, hey, hey guys, it's okay. Mike, and he puts his hand on my back. He goes, you just go in there. Don't worry about all this. You just have a good day with your family. I'm like, thank you so much. So I go to step up and the other manager steps in front of me and does that like shoulder bump where pop. I'm like, bro, <sighs> I'm not feeling so godly right now, right? <laughs> there was a time in my life I had cornrows, I'm just saying. <sighs> <laughs> I went on my way. Have you ever noticed that there's times in your life where it's very difficult to remain calm? Where something happens in your life, something is chaotic, and it's so difficult to remain in that place. Pastor Ben and Melissa have done a phenomenal job teaching in this series in the first three weeks about how when there's chaos in our life, we need to make sure we are leaning on God and God's promises for our life when those storms hit. And so as I was praying through what I felt like God wanted me to share Today, I thought about those times when I feel like my life is just falling apart. Those times where life just seems so difficult. When life isn't going the way that you planned for it to go. Like no matter what you do, you can't get inside that theme park that you paid to be inside of. And I had this thought, what if we can change our perspective to the thought that it's not happening to me, it's happening for him. Now there's plenty of stressful situations that we bring upon ourselves as well, aren't there? I mean, we, we do struggle to remain calm due to some self-inflicted stress in our life as well. And I'm sure if I did a poll of everyone sitting in this room and all of you joining us online, if I did a poll right now, there's no one in this room or online that's like, yes, I try to hurt myself on a regular basis. We wouldn't say that. However, there's so many times where we are stressed and there's chaos surrounding our finances, yet we're at the exact same time living beyond our means. And we're hurting ourselves. There's so many times where maybe we're stressed and we're driving chaotically. We, we got some road rage and our blood pressure is boiling and all these things because we're trying to get somewhere on time. But truth be told, we just didn't leave our house early enough. And we hurt ourself. I think about the times where maybe we stayed up too late the night before. We didn't study for that test that we should have. We didn't prepare like we should have. We didn't prioritize the correct things in our life. And in those moments, we hurt Ourself. We had control of those moments. And I'll be honest with you, if I could just vent for a moment, this is my soapbox moment right here today. I get so tired of the victim mentality that today's culture has. Where every single time we are uncomfortable, it's woe is me and it's everyone else's fault that I'm hurting today. When the reality is, I think about when Jesus was tempted by Satan and Satan's like, hey, jump off this cliff and you're not gonna die. The angels are gonna catch you. And Jesus is like, don't test the Lord your God. For some of us, when there's temptation in front of us, we just wanna grab it. We jump on off that cliff and then we sit there and whine and complain because we don't understand why we're falling. We're falling because we jumped. So there's definitely some times where it's self-inflicted. But there's also plenty of times where the pain just happens to us, isn't there? Times where things happen that are out of our control. Have you ever been hurt that way? Sometimes it just happens to us. It's, it doesn't seem fair, it just happens. Whether it's as simple as me catching some Universal Studios employee on a really bad day, 
Or if it's something actually important in your life, like a maybe medical test that came back in a way that you didn't want it to come back. Maybe it's something relationally where there's someone else that's making some poor life choices because of their own insecurities and what they're doing is hurting you. Maybe it's something like a natural disaster like this last week that causes damage, that takes lives, and it hurts. Regardless of how painful the situation is, what if we could change our perspective? I'm not saying that God is doing those things to you because he's not doing those things to you. But the Bible does say in Romans 8, 28 that he can take all these things and he can work them for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Someone say purpose. And that's what I wanna to talk to today about, is your purpose. Because it's not happening to me, rather it's happening for him. Today I wanna to look at someone in the Bible who faced quite a bit. Someone who went through so many different situations, plenty of chaos in his life, Plenty of reasons to be mad at God and to, to sit in a corner and cry and complain that God is not good. I heard a pastor just the other day say, if you have time to complain about it, you have time to pray about it. How many know that's true? And this person that I want to talk to you about today is Paul. Now, you probably know Paul as the person who wrote the majority of the New Testament. That's completely true. Maybe you know Paul as the guy that was previously known as Saul. Also true. We know that growing up, his father was a Pharisee. And that Saul was highly educated. He knew the word of God like the back of his hand. We know that he went out for a portion of his life and he persecuted Christians. He persecuted those that followed Christ. Matter of fact, the very first martyr in the Bible died for his faith and sharing the good news of Jesus was a man named Stephen. And we know that when Stephen was stoned to death, the Bible says that Saul was there. Later, Saul is found persecuting more Christians. He's trying to find where clusters of them are and he's after them. He's on his way to this place called Damascus and on his way there, God gets a hold of him. He blinds him. He corrects him, and from that moment on, Saul, later known as Paul, his life is never the same. So today I want to look at a portion of scripture that Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. This letter to the church of Philippi is what we know today as the book of Philippians in our Bible. Now what Paul would do is that he would go and he would start a church. He would establish a church. He would find some leaders and establish leadership in that church, build them up, and then he would move on and do another church, plant another church, try to spread the word of God, reach as many people as he possibly could. And so as he's writing the leadership of the church of Philippi, we know it's about 10 years after he planted that exact church. And what makes this situation so unique is that Paul is writing this letter while he's under house arrest as a prisoner in Rome. Matter of fact, he's being watched by some of the most powerful guards in the entire empire. The ones that were tasked with protecting the emperor and the palace. And as a prisoner, he's awaiting this trial where he thought that he could very well possibly lose his life. Yet even in the midst of this, he never abandoned his calling and his purpose that God had on his life. I don't know about you, but I feel like if I was in the, this position, I would not do as well as Paul. The guy at Universal almost broke me. <laughs> it's easy when life brings you some trials to be like, God, why? Why are you allowing this? But I feel like Paul's perspective was not, God, why is this happening to me? But rather, he had the perspective of, God, what can I do for you in this moment. I believe note takers are history makers. I want you to write some notes today. You can find all the notes on our app at Gen Church FL. But I wanna to talk today about how to remain calm in the middle of the chaos 
in your life, whether it is self-inflicted or it's just something that's happening to you, I think we could pull a lot from Paul's life. And so how do you remain calm? Number one is this. Number one is you need to know your purpose. I want to say know your purpose. You need to know your purpose. You cannot accomplish something that you cannot define. You have to know what your purpose is. If you want to know the vision that God gave Pastor Ben and Melissa for Generation Church, it's pretty simple. It's right out there on the wall in big letters for you as soon as you walk in. It's clear. It's defined. To accomplish purpose, you have to know what your purpose is. We were just having this conversation with our staff this week in our staff meeting. We were talking about um, in a work environment, which one is better, passion or purpose? How do you define them? And we were looking at passion. This is what passion is. It's defined this way. It is the excitement and enthusiasm that you have about what you're doing. Now, I'm a passionate person. I love some passion. If you can't tell, I, I love what I get to do. I am passionate about it. But then what is purpose? Purpose is this. It's knowing that you are contributing, that you have meaning. It's knowing why you're doing what you're doing. And here's what I want you to understand today is that purpose trumps passion in performance every single time. In Philippians 1, Paul shows us that he clearly knew his purpose. He says this in verse 12. He says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to, and I underline this, this is his purpose, to advance the gospel. See, Paul understood his purpose. He knew what his mission was. His purpose was to advance the gospel, to reach the lost for Jesus. But at the exact same time, I want you to look at this, he's not neglecting or ignoring reality. He knows he's not in a great situation right now. He talks about the things that have happened to me. He knows he's having a bad day. But the negative circumstances surrounding him don't change what his purpose for God is. Here's the second thing I want you to write down today. If you want to remain calm, number two is this. You need to live out your purpose. I want to say live it out. You got to live it out. Philippians 1.13, it says this. As a result, Paul says, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. I like how he words that right there. You notice he does not say I'm in chains because of Christ. I'm in chains because I did what God told me to do. He says, I'm in chains for Christ because of my chains. Most of my brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Have you noticed that whenever one person has the boldness and the courage to step up and do what is right, other people begin to follow? Like if you're in a group of people and everyone's gossiping about something, if one person steps up and says, hey guys, let's not do that right now. You know, everyone else starts going, oh, I didn't want to either. No, I agree, right? It takes that one person to kind of go against the grain and say, you know what? No, we're not going to do this. We're going to do this. This is what's right. And then other people start following suit, right? And this is what's happening here. Because of his boldness, other people are now beginning to be bold for the word of God. He continues, he says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But I love this. I underlined it. You need to underline it. He says this, but what does it matter? What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, here's his purpose again, Christ is preached. And because of this, I'm going to rejoice. See, Paul lived out his God-given purpose at all times. And even when there was drama and people preaching for the wrong reasons and people trying to stir up trouble for Paul, he says, who cares? It doesn't matter. I'm not going to sit here and complain about it. I'm not going to sit here and waste my energy on it. 
I'm not going to sit here and allow these negative thoughts to grow and fester in me. I'm not going to gossip about it. He's like, I don't care. Why? Because he is living out his purpose. And either way, people are coming to know Christ. See, he stayed focused knowing it's not happening to me. It's happening for him. Unfortunately, what happens many times is that even if we have our eyes on Jesus and we have our eyes on the purpose that he has for our life, when trouble comes, we begin to lose our calm. And we're trying to talk about how to remain calm, but so many times when things happen in our life, we begin to lose it, don't we? We lean toward the chaos. We want to tell that universal employee what actually is going on inside our mind, right? And our heart may be in the right place going like, well, I just don't want that person to hurt someone else. They need to be stopped. Absolutely. But what happens so easily is that we begin to creep into this other place where we turn all of our focus on our problem instead of our purpose. So I like to think of it like this. If, if I know what my purpose is and I'm facing my purpose, I'm going for everything that God has for me. When chaos happens, a lot of times I'm like, hey, stop, stop. You need to stop. Chaos, stop, right? There's a problem. I need to stop it. And as I keep on going through this time, eventually I find myself staring at my problem and I have my back towards my purpose. It's not done intentionally. It's not done with ill will. But so many times it's easy for us to turn our back on the purpose that God has for us and put all of our focus on the problem that's in front of us. So how do you know you're doing that? I wrote down some notes on how I know I'm doing that. Here's the first thing. I realize when I'm focusing more on my problem is when I talk more about my problem than my purpose. I wrote this down. When I'm focusing more on my problem, it's when everyone else knows my problem, but very few know my purpose. When the problem is completely consuming your mind, it's all you're thinking about. You're not present anymore with your family. You're not present in what you're doing because all you're thinking about is the problem. I also wrote this down. I find that when I'm focused on my problem, the pace toward my purpose drastically slows down. Look, I truly believe that Satan cannot defeat you, so he's just gonna try to distract you and allow you to defeat yourself. It seems like this simple thought, but I feel like it's one that we need to understand because so many times I've seen this. So many of us will regularly attend services and we're getting to God's house and we grow in our faith and we're building uh, around with other believers and we're growing and going in the way that God has for us, the purpose that he has for us. We're serving on the dream team. We're volunteering. We're a part of something bigger than ourselves and doing life with other people. We're in a small group. We have some people that we're growing with and can call on whenever we are, are weak. We're tithing. We're giving God back what is his. We're doing these things. We're trusting him. We're walking in our purpose. And then something happens. There's a problem in our life. Whether it's self-inflicted or something that just happens to us, regardless, it hurts. And something I've witnessed so many times is that it is when we experience these moments in our life, when this problem happens and we're feeling hurt, we begin to focus so much on our problem that we begin to disengage with our purpose. We stop going to church as often. We're, we're busy now. We're focused on all the other things we have. We don't really have time for a small group anymore. We're not gonna serve. Or we're gonna serve a lot less. I'm available one time a quarter. We pull back on tithing because we begin to look at this problem that's in front of us and we stop engaging with the purpose that God has for us. And what happens is the longer I keep staring at this problem with my back towards my purpose, I begin to drift towards the problem and I disengage. See, Satan knows that God has a purpose for your life. And so he's going to try to distract you, to get you to disengage because he knows that there is a purpose that you possess. And his goal is just to still kill and destroy from you. But what does Paul say when people try to stir up trouble for him? When people try to create some distractions for him? He says, what does it matter? 
The important thing is that Christ is preached. And because of this, I'm going to rejoice. Because of this, I will remain calm. Here's the third thing. If you want to remain calm, I want you to write this down. We need to maintain perspective of our purpose. We need to maintain perspective of our purpose. How many know that you have to maintain your perspective? You can have a good perspective of a situation, but as time goes on and that situation continues and you grow tired, how many know that at some point you need to maintain that perspective of the purpose? A little backstory, I love doing yard work. I'm gonna be that guy, I'm gonna be the old man in my yard every day, I love yard work. So I landscaped our yard myself. I love it. I love being outside and, and doing yard work. At the exact same time, I also love being outside with friends, grilling hamburgers and hot dogs, all those things. I just love that stuff. So about a week ago, we had friends stay with us over the weekend and I was excited. I'm gonna grill outside and do all these things. I got my yard work all done. My yard's looking pretty and I'm gonna have hamburgers and all. It's gonna be a good weekend. And then my grill dies. Don't just die, it dies midway through cooking the food, right? It doesn't happen before, it has to happen a while. So now I'm in this moment where I'm like, okay, I need to have a good perspective here. I get to hang out with my friends. We'll figure this out. We're gonna move all the food inside. We're gonna do it this way. We're gonna figure out these things, right? My grill is now dead. Then a few days later, we get into the hurricanes. And these hurricanes and tornadoes start coming through. We're in Port St. Lucie. And so now I'm in this place where I'm like, okay, I had good perspective, but now I need to maintain my perspective, right? My family is safe. All things are good. During the storm, I decided to stay up through the night just in case I needed to do anything with my family. I felt like one of us should be up and ready to go. So I'm sitting in my living room and all of a sudden there was a loud caw -caw 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 on my roof. I thought, well, it was way too early for Santa. So, <laughs> scared me half to death. And then it fell off my roof and it was a full-size trampoline that landed on my roof. And you begin to let your thoughts run, right? And you go, why did my neighbor choose not to strap down his trampoline appropriately? He knew a hurricane was coming. Why didn't he do that? And now you're beginning to get frustrated, right? You're going, okay, I need to maintain my perspective. We got a new trampoline, right? <laughs> there it is. One Christmas gift off the list. Then all of a sudden it takes off in my yard. And it cut right through my favorite palm tree, cut it in half and killed it. You're sitting there going like, Maintain your perspective. It's just a tree that I planted myself, paid for myself, because my neighbor didn't strap down his trampoline. We then go without power. So I take the burners out of my grill that doesn't work now, put charcoal in there. Like, hey, we'll mix some coffee and food on this grill. We're going to do some charcoal. We're going to have camp out at our house with our kids. And hey, this is fun. We're going to have a good time. We're maintaining our perspective. Then we go a second day without power. They're getting a little restless. Luckily, we have an amazing family, Chuck and Heather here at GC, and they brought us a generator to run some cords and keep our refrigerator going and have some fans and lights because we're getting super hot inside our house there for a second. And we continued to have to maintain our perspective. See, the key to continuing in a healthy way is to maintain your perspective, and it goes for your purpose as well. You can know your purpose. You can live out your purpose. But when you can't seem to get your breath from each chaotic moment back to back to back to back, you're gonna have to choose to maintain your perspective on your purpose. This is what Paul continues to say in verse 19. He says, and I will continue. Someone say continue. I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage 
So that now, as always, I underline this, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. This is his purpose again. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in my body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Again, it's his purpose. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm so torn between the two. See, Paul had the perspective that no matter what happens to him, it actually doesn't matter. Because regardless if they kill him or let him go, Jesus will be preached. And because he is maintaining his perspective, that it doesn't matter if they kill him or he walks, in either way, Christ is preached, he knows that God wins. You know, many scholars believe the reason that the gospel spread so quickly throughout Rome was because Paul's influence on the guards that were watching him. These guards that were assigned to Paul were the most uh, influential guards on the most influential people in the entire empire. And so from their front row seats to Paul's life, while he's sitting there in chains, their lives began to be changed for Christ. We have to maintain our perspective on our purpose. Here's the fourth thing I want you to write down today. If you're gonna remain calm, we have to stand firm for your purpose. We have to stand firm. Someone say stand firm. He continues in verse 27. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Listen, there's gonna be some in your life that oppose you. There's gonna be some opposition in your life. But Paul stands firm in this moment. He stands firm in his purpose because he saw his opposition as an opportunity. I want you to write that down today. Your opposition is your opportunity. See, Paul could have easily focused on his problem, focused on his prison sentence, but instead, he continued to use his life to preach the gospel of Christ. While being a prisoner, he continued to write letters to churches, which his God-inspired words are transforming lives today in our Bible. And in his moments of chaos, he stood firm. He remained calm. He refused to lose ground. He refused to quit. He refused to back off. He refused to walk towards the problem and stay focused on his purpose. So my question for you today is what is your purpose? Is your purpose to climb the corporate ladder? See if you can make it to the top? Is your purpose to see how many Little League sports we can get on one calendar? Feels like that sometimes, right? Is your purpose to have a lot of things, a lot of stuff? That's not it. See, your purpose is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ with your life. You know, last week, my middle son, Max, he loves his Legos. So he, I got home and he had made some Legos for me. Thank you. I brought it with me today. I love his imagination, making all these different things out of Legos and I get home and he's like, Dad, I made a cruise ship. I'm like, yeah, you did. Let's go on vacation. And he's going through and he's showing me everything that he made. He's going like, in this part right here is where you eat at the cafeteria, you get 24-hour pizza, you know. 
you got the water slide and you got the kitty slide because there needs to be a kitty slide for little kids and putting all these things together. This is where you navigate, where you drive the ship and he's telling me all these things. And then he turns it around. And this may have been the most challenging moment for me. He said, then I made a room right here. Because when you meet people in the boat, then you can take them right here and tell them about Jesus. And I thought, how many of us would show up on a cruise ship with the mindset that I'm gonna focus on my purpose and that while I'm here, I'm gonna see how many people I can reach for Jesus. They're all trapped with me for a week, right? So it's Jesus or jump. I mean, we'll, we'll, one way or the other. You can't get rid of me. What if we walked into it with that mindset? What impact could we have for the kingdom of God? See, unfortunately, so many times, the truth is, is that we are thinking about ourselves and our comforts. We don't wanna feel the chaos. We don't wanna have the problem. The word says that in this world, there's gonna be trouble. I take heart because I've overcome the world. It's time for us to focus on our purpose. If we truly understood our purpose, even in the middle of a tough situation, a bad day, a bad report, financial stress, work-related issues, family stuff, whatever it is, regardless of the chaos, what if we could look at the opposition as our opportunity? It's not happening to us. It's happening for him. I truly believe if we could change our perspective, what we would find is that regardless of how hard life is, I truly believe that you'll find that you can remain calm in the midst of the storm. So right now I wanna pray for you with every head bowed. God, we thank you for the purpose and the calling that you place on our life. God, we thank you that we do have the opportunity to reach the lost for you, that you'll use us as a vessel to be a bright light in our community and our world around us. But God, I also pray that you give us the courage to be that person that goes against the grain, to be bold enough to stand up and say, this is my purpose. And I'm gonna live out the purpose that God has given me regardless of what's happening around me. I'm gonna keep my eyes on my purpose. And I'm gonna turn my back on my problem. God, I pray you continue to challenge us and use us so that others can know you. Because Jesus, it's all about you. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. As we stay in this moment of prayer, there may be some of you in this place that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You've never fully surrendered your life to him. Or maybe at some point in your life you were living for God and there were plenty of distractions along the way and you began to turn your back on the purpose that God had for you and focus all on the problems. And today you're saying, Mike, I need a fresh start in my life. I need a new beginning. I need to start over. I need Jesus. If that's you, there's no one else looking around. I just want to pray for you. But I'd love to know who you are. So right now, if you're saying, yeah, Mike, pray for me, just lift your hand. No one's looking around. Say, that's me. I need a fresh start with God. Amen. I see you. I see you. Amen. 
as a church, we're gonna pray this as a family today. Will you join me? Dear God, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. God, to make us whole when we were broken. God, to make us new when we felt like we were too far gone. God, thank you for giving us a calling. Thank you for giving us a purpose. And thank you for making a way for us to spend eternity with you. God, I pray today for a fresh start. I pray for a new beginning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said a big amen and amen. Come on, let's celebrate those today that said yes to Jesus.